Without any forewarning or consultation at all, the Prime Minister was intending to implement a range of measures that would dramatically affect Aboriginal Territorians. When I asked why he was taking such unilateral, unilateral action, he simply repeated it was a national crisis. When I said that if that was the case, then I needed to speak with him about the detail as soon as possible and would be on the plane to Canberra that day, he told me not to bother, that he was too busy and that maybe he would have some time available in a couple of weeks. As you can imagine, I was pretty gobsmacked. Major decisions had been made and were being made about the Northern Territory, about Aboriginal Territorians, without any consultation with us. And now the Prime Minister was telling me he wouldn't make time to talk about it. Talk about being second class. However, I quickly realised why John Howard didn't want to talk to me about his emergency response. He told the Australian people that his intervention in the Northern Territory was in response to the outcomes of a report I had commissioned into child sexual abuse in our Aboriginal communities. The report was called Little Children Are Sacred and had been released just a few weeks before. The report honestly spelled out the extent of the problem that we faced. Its recommendations, all 97 of them, were wide-ranging, covering many aspects of government and non-government operation and called for additional expenditure of hundreds of, hundreds of millions of dollars. However, the overriding recommendation that wound its way all through that report was that the only viable way to tackle child sexual abuse was to engage Aboriginal people in implementing change. That it was all about consultation and partnership, not arbitrary government implementation. But even though John Howard said he was responding to that report, he ignored both the report and its recommendations. Instead, over a period of a few days in Canberra, a very different response was put together, a kind of grab bag of measures. Consultation and partnership were thrown away and a bold, quick fix approach was devised to the very complex issues around child abuse. The first that Aboriginal Territorians knew about the response was when teams led by soldiers in uniform entered their communities with the stated mission of stabilise, normalise and exit. You can imagine how Aboriginal people reacted to what appeared to be an invasion by the army. Many hid their children, many simply fled their communities, went bush. Many talked about the fear they felt and their concern that their children would be taken, another stolen generation. So why did John Howard take the action he did? Was it because the Northern Territory had been too slow to act on the problem of child sex abuse? That was argued at the time, but it doesn't hold true when you look at the facts. We had a weighty report with nearly 100 recommendations. Sensibly, we needed to work through them. How to implement had to be worked out, especially since consultation and partnership were vital. And then we had to find the resources. We did this quickly, within three months, and when we compared our response with that of other states to their own similar reports and inquiries, we discovered we'd responded both more quickly and with greater investment. Did John Howard simply think the recommendations of the Little Children of Sacred Report were wrong or misguided? Did he think that his emergency response measures put together in a few days were a better solution than those in a report that had taken 12 months to prepare and was written with expert input and wide consultation with Aboriginal communities? John Howard was never questioned about that at the time. There was an acceptance, particularly in the media, that his measures must have been on the right track because he sounded so committed to tackling child sex abuse in remote Northern Territory communities. There was lots of talk about the Little Children of Sacred Report, but no one asked about whether its recommendations were being followed. I remember asking one senior journalist who was expressing her concern about the whole report and about the extent of the problem when I said, have you read it? And she said, no. The Northern Territory Emergency Response required 500 pages of federal legislation, complex legislation significantly affecting the rights of Aboriginal Territorians. Yet very few voices were raised in the federal parliament as major changes were made to legislation such as the Aboriginal Land Rights Act. Even the setting aside of the Racial Discrimination Act caused little outrage 
My federal Labor colleagues were desperate to avoid being wedged over the issue with an election soon to be called and simply ducked out of the way. But the central reason that John Howard created his own emergency response was cheerfully revealed later that year, 25th of November, the day after John Howard lost office. Speaking on the ABC's Insiders program, the former Foreign Affairs Minister Alexander Downer said, and I'll have to paraphrase his words, that the emergency response was designed to win votes. The Coalition thought that taking bold and unilateral action on child sex abuse in the Northern Territory would appeal to voters and so lift the flagging performance of the government. Downer said in a very matter-of-fact way that he has, it was disappointing the strategy hadn't worked. The cynicism of Alexander Downer's words that morning appalled me, that the Howard Ministry could take a most serious problem like child abuse in the Northern Territory and decide on a course of action that was more dictated by electoral consideration than concerns for Aboriginal Territorians was a disgrace. That my federal Labor colleagues did nothing to stop it was just as bad. I felt like a lone voice in the political wilderness. The Howard publicity machine was in full force, so any attempt to point out that the emergency response measures were not in line with the recommendations of the Little Children of Sacred report was futile. I felt I had no option but to commit to working with the Howard package while trying to get my views heard about the elements of it that were totally unacceptable. And that was a difficult task, especially since some of the measures included were most welcome if long overdue. Hundreds of millions of dollars were committed to building new homes in our communities and refurbishing existing ones. Funding was made available to extend police presence in small remote communities, along with extra health specialists and teachers. But hand in hand with this welcome financial investment came some most unfair and punitive measures. Mandatory income quarantining for all Aboriginal people on a Centrelink payment, the abolition of important community employment programs, government demanding leases over Aboriginal communities for whole houses would be built, and new alcohol restrictions that were essentially window dressing. So what does it mean to be income quarantined? John Howard put this initiative in place on all Aboriginal Territorians receiving a payment from Centrelink, so whether you're on an aged pension, a disability support pension or unemployment benefit. His reason was there were Aboriginal people neglecting their children and wasting money on alcohol and gambling. Half of that welfare payment would be quarantined for what the Commonwealth determined as basic requirements. Sounds reasonable, you say. The problem was it was not selective, targeting those who were neglecting children or abusing alcohol. It was a blanket measure that covered all Aboriginal people on some form of benefit even those who didn't touch alcohol or gamble and who were good money managers. So let me introduce you to Andrea. Andrea is a mother of three who lives in Catherine, which is south of Darwin. In 2007, Andrea was income quarantined simply because she was Aboriginal, was receiving a disability support pension and lived at an Aboriginal living area in the town of Catherine. All of a sudden, half her income had to go into the new basics card and be spent on food, medicine and clothing. The other half of her income came to her in cash, and from that, rent and utilities were paid. If Andrea wanted to buy furniture for her home or school photos for her children, she had to go and get quotes and take those quotes to Centrelink for approval. If approved, Centrelink would then authorise payment. Andrea had always managed her income pretty well and says so of many others. She said that when quarantining first started, it was all the sober mums and the elderly who were first in line at Centrelink. It wasn't the ones who were misusing their money. It was all the good people, she said. And those people felt shame and anger at having to stand in that line. Income quarantining took from Andrea an independence that she valued, managing her money. She felt unjustly targeted and unfairly treated. She felt Aboriginal, Territorian and second class. Another measure of the emergency response was abruptly ending a community work program called CDEP that employed thousands of Aboriginal people across the Territory and had been in operation since the 70s. This is how the emergency response measures 
and its abolition affected one small group of women in Central Australia. They were the community's artists and their part-time wages were paid through CDEP. From time to time they would supplement that wage by the sale of their art. Under the Aboriginal Land Rights Act, Aboriginal people had won inalienable freehold title to their land. For many, the idea of having to lease that land they owned to government was unreasonable, and for many it was deeply resented. But the communities were over a barrel. No lease, no new housing. The emergency response also included much publicised new measures around alcohol consumption and alcohol abuse. The Little Children of Sacred Report clearly identified the link between alcohol abuse and child abuse and called for a greater effort to reduce this terrible problem. In the report it was described as rivers of grog. But the measures introduced were not well considered and did little more than add just another layer of restriction to those already in place across the Territory. Most Aboriginal communities are dry. Alcohol is banned and has been banned for decades. There are only a handful of communities, I think it's eight in all, with a social club or a bar. As a result, those community members who want to consume alcohol do so outside the community's boundaries, in bush drinking areas or at the closest roadhouse, town or city. Much of the alcohol purchased is takeaway. That means it's mostly drunk in public places, in parks, shopping centres, along the verges of major roads or in the bush. Over the years, substantial resources and strategies have been employed to reduce the damage of this drinking behaviour. You've got police patrols, Aboriginal community patrols, declaring public places alcohol-free, reducing hours of takeaway, reducing what alcohol can be purchased, and controlling who can make those purchases. Decades of strategies and intervention that affected everyone in the Territory. The most significant measure of the emergency response in relation to alcohol was not to take a new approach, but simply to extend the dry areas around communities. While such a measure might look strong on paper, in practice all it did was to cause those who wanted to drink alcohol to congregate further from their communities, often in unsafe and isolated locations. So let me give you an example of that. One community in Arnhem Land had their no alcohol boundaries extended by 50 kilometres. The intention, of course, was to make it more difficult for those who wanted to consume alcohol. But that's not how it turned out. Community members who wanted a beer at the end, and many of them, for it was the end of a working day, would drive the 50 kilometres to do so and often not return for work the next day. Families in the community would worry about safety at this distant drinking area and the local police had their workload seriously increased with extra cumulative kilometres they had to drive. One of the senior men from this community told me he couldn't say, see how these new restrictions were going to change anything. Further prohibition, he said, wasn't ever going to promote a responsible drinking culture within his community. And he said his grandson was an example of this, that he'd soon be having his first beer and it would probably be a warm one down the road of the local drinking area. It's time he told me to stop sending the whole issue of the consumption of alcohol down the road or to the nearest town. He wants his community to end prohibition and take the first careful steps towards opening a social club. He thinks the current situation continues to make his community second class. This senior man's views dovetail with those of many Aboriginal residents in that nearest town. They also agree that their countrymen living in the surrounding communities need to find a sensible way to deal with alcohol and its consumption and not just export the problem to town. They want respect for country to work both ways, in town and in the communities. But these views are not widely held. Many Aboriginal people equally strongly believe that prohibition has to continue, that having dry communities is the only way for Aboriginal women and children to have protection from the worst of alcohol abuse. They don't want change and would certainly not agree with this senior man from Arnhem Land and his hopes for a new alcohol paradigm for his grandson. Alcohol consumption and its abuse and what new and effective strategies can be put in place remains still and will for many years to come a challenging issue in the Northern Territory.
I'd just like to make one final point about the unfairness of the emergency response, and that's the damaging stereotyping of all Aboriginal Territorians that it allowed. In the public discussion, no distinction was made between offenders and non-offenders when it came to child abuse. No distinction between alcohol abusers and the many Aboriginal people who've never consumed alcohol. No distinction between those whose children were well cared for and attended school and those children who were neglected. Blanket and punitive measures were casually applied to thousands of Aboriginal Territorians. I won't forget the visit by a delega delegation of Aboriginal men who complained bitterly that the emergency response was categorising all countrymen as child abusers and drunks. They wanted to let the politicians and other Australians know that there were many Aboriginal men who were good fathers and who were sober. They thought I, as Chief Minister, could stop it. I had to tell them I didn't have the power to stop this federal government action. It was humil humiliating to have to tell them so. Territorians were hopeful that a change of federal government in November 2007 would put an, un an end to the unfair measures of the Howard emergency response but that didn't happen. They continued under the Rudd government, even following the recommendations of the Review Board, headed by West Australian Aboriginal leader Peter Yu in 2008. It wasn't even until 2010 that the Racial Discrimination Act was reinstated for Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory. A Northern Territory election was held in August this year. The Labor government, led by Paul Henderson, lost office because thousands of Aboriginal Territorians decided this time not to vote Labor as they had traditionally done. They voted Conservative for the Country Liberal Party. And why? One of my Aboriginal friends summed it up succinctly. He said, it's been reform after reform after reform after reform for Aboriginal people, and they're simply tired of it. The election gave many a timely opportunity to voice their discontent about two major government policies. Both had Labor Party tags in them. The wide-ranging measures of Howard's emergency response, now continued by Federal Labor, and the Territory Labor initiated local government reforms. It didn't matter that over the past five years more money had been spent in the bush than ever before an historic investment in hundreds of new houses and infrastructure, greater police presence and more teachers, or that local government reform was necessary to underpin better governance and service delivery in communities. As my friend said, too much reform, too often, too much disturbance of lives. It was a vote that said, we've had enough. And so with that clear protest from many Aboriginal Territorians about what they consider is unfair and unjust treatment, I'll finish this short history of the Northern Territory and our time of self-government. And my thanks to you for coming on this journey with me. Looking back over the last 34 years, there's no doubt that we have been challenged and frustrated by our second-class constitutional status. There's no question our political institutions have been affected by the power of the Federal Parliament to overturn our legislation or impose legislation. No question that from time to time our political effectiveness has been circumscribed or that territory and lives have been unfairly targeted by thoughtless Federal policies. Being a state would have meant I had a very different story to tell you tonight. However, I do hope that I haven't sounded like some terrible northern whinger, just because I'm talking about some of the deficits of being a Territorian. There are many, many positives about being a Territorian, and I'm extraordinarily proud of our achievements in the top end. It's just that I strongly believe that we are entitled to the same constitutional status as other Australians. We might be smaller in numbers and younger in terms of experience of government, but that should not diminish our rights. That's simply unfair. And if Morris and Doris Blackburn were here tonight, I'm certain they'd be strong supporters of my argument for territory equity. Thank you.